Thank you very much uh, for this nice introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here, and I'd like to thank the organizers for this, uh, for arranging such nice conference and inviting me. It is a really a great pleasure to learn and re relearn things and uh, have interaction with a lot of uh, so many different uh, uh, researchers. So without further ado, I uh, like to uh, talk about uh, our uh, previous work. So today I'll talk about the generation of uh, electric field induced tilted unconventional spin current by the antiferromagnet ruthenium dioxide. So later, uh, throughout this talk, we'll see that the normal antiferromagnetism cannot explain this data. We need the spin speed band structures. So this work was done when I was doing postdoc uh, at Cornell University in uh, Robert Berman and uh, Dan Ralph's group. And now, uh, last year, I moved to University of Mines, working uh, in Matthias Clavis group. And I'm very much thankful to Humboldt Foundation uh, for my fellowship. Uh, outline of my presentation is the following. First, I'll start with the background and motivation for our research, talking about the conventional and unconventional torques. Mainly, I will talk about what are the gaps or key challenges that uh, we are facing to implement the second generation MRAM and how to overcome this. And one of the uh, possible solutions uh, could be this new uh, material uh, referred to as alter magnet. And here, uh, although we have learned a lot about this material uh, throughout this uh, workshop, I briefly summarize uh, some of the key uh, characteristics. And after that, I'll talk about my uh, experimental results that how we can unambiguously detect uh, this uh, special property through our electrical measurement. And also, I like to uh, highlight the challenges that we may face as an experimentalist and how to overcome this, and so on. OK, so um, one of the key aspect uh, is to obtain, uh, to manipulate the magnet by spin orbit torques. For that, uh, one of the easiest way uh, to do is by generating a transverse spin current, by applying uh, electric current in the heavy metal, uh, because uh, it has a large spin orbit coupling that allows us to have transverse spin current due to spin hole effect. Now, if we have an adjacent magnet, the magnet absorbs the spin current and it experiences different types of torques. There are primarily two types of torques, damping like torque and field like torques. And if uh, in the nanostructure devices, if the spin current density is enough, that can essentially switch the magnet. So when we talk about switching the magnet, it is basically the right operation of MRAM. However, we can also read the magnetization state of this structure by simply measuring TMR of this MTJ, meaning we can uh, achieve uh, both read and write operations. So this could be the prototype of uh, second generation spin orbit torque based magnetic random access memories. So very exciting. So as time progressed, uh, we need, uh, it, uh, instead of having in plane magnet, it is desired to have out of plane PM magnet because of the scaling uh, scalability. So uh, this is needed for the high density memory applications. But there is one catch, because the generated spins are in the plane, uh, in this, in this uh, mechanism, so, so that uh, because of which we cannot have uh, feel-free uh, deterministic switching of perpendicular magnet. But however, one can always apply uh, external symmetry breaking field as shown here in this pioneer works, and one can get deterministic switching. So this is extremely encouraging, but however, this is not very ideal uh, for the technological application because we need to apply a symmetry breaking field. So this is the so-called challenge of the second generation MRAM uh, technology. Now the question is, uh, how can this problem be addressed? Okay, one of the uh, things uh, that we can imagine that if we have a system in which if you run electric current, then if we get an out of plane spin flowing in the out of plane direction, then that will, that will directly interact on the perpendicular magnet. And in that way, we can get very efficient out of plane anti-damping torque based switching, very similar to this uh, scenario. Now, the, the obvious question uh, comes to our mind, uh, in which material we can get such unconventional spin current. 
Okay, let's assume that if I apply electric current in this material, it generates outer plane spins flowing in the outer plane direction. Now, if we take the mirror reflection, then the electric field or applied electric current doesn't change the polarity, but spins do. That means this is not possible in the regular uh, polycrystalline materials. We must break the mirror symmetry and also twofold rotational symmetry. So this has been experimentally uh, shown for, uh, for the first time in the low uh, symmetry uh, materials such as tungsten dichloride from uh, Cornell group. And later on, uh, other uh, low symmetry materials have also been uh, investigated such as copper platinum. Now the question is, is this the only way we can break a symmetry and get uh, this type of unconventional spin current and spin torques? The answer is yes, uh, there are other possibilities. For example, if we have magnetic ordering, that also can break the symmetry and we can have unconventional spin currents. And also there are a lot of uh, literature in last um, five, six years. I just provide you a couple of instances. So in this particular work, the magnetic trial layer structure has been implemented and it has been shown that in plane current generates uh, out of plane spins and uh, that they have um, achieved to see uh, field free switching. So during my PhD, I was also uh, working on similar uh, GMR trial layer stacks. In this case, I found that in plane uh, electric current produces out of plane effective magnetic field. So both out of plane uh, uh, polarized spin current or out of plane effective magnetic field uh, can be beneficial uh, uh, to manipulate a perpendicular magnet. So it's good so far. But uh, this uh, ferromagnet as a source of uh, spin current can be tricky because it can be susceptible to uh, external magnetic field fluctuation. So what if, uh, if we uh, choose something robust such as like antiferromagnet, because in that case we can also have magnetic ordering. The question is that can we get uh, this type of unconventional uh, spin current or not? So here comes, uh, uh, sorry. Okay, so here comes the material a ruthenium dioxide that is an uh, antiferromagnet. And later on I show that it can generate different type of unconventional spin current and uh, that is uh, correlated with the recent prediction of ultramagnetic band structures. So let's very uh, quickly uh, recap uh, all the concepts accumulated here, uh, some of the concepts accumulated in this workshop. So let's uh, consider the case of a ferromagnet with a finite magnetization where we naturally have the spin split bands, up spin and down spin bands. Now, considering an antiferromagnet, a uh, classical collinear antiferromagnet with net magnetization zero. So up spin and down spin electrons are shown with two different colors, green and purple color balls. Now by taking space and time reversal operation, it seems to be, it is a PT symmetric. And the Kramer's theorem dictates that we must have spin degenerate bands. So this is fine. Now let's consider the ruthenium dioxide, the material uh, we are interested. So these are the ruthenium atoms, uh, up spin and down spin, uh, surrounded by non-magnetic oxygen atoms. So if I uh, ignore this oxygen atoms, it exactly looks like this classical collinear antiferromagnet. But the moment we have this uh, non-magnetic oxygen, uh, oxygen atoms, it immediately breaks up its symmetry and 90 degree rotational symmetry um, uh, is appearing here. And because of that, uh, we can have the spin split bands as it has been uh, talked about and discussed again and again in this workshop. But very importantly, if I look at the, the real space, then it is, a, it is an antiferromagnet. So we will have benefits uh, of antiferromagnets such as we can have extremely compact devices. However, at the same time, it also has K-dependent spin speed bands, uh, something similar to uh, ferromagnets. So we can also couple the properties or advantages that we can get in the ferromagnet. So uh, we can, uh, that's, how, that's why it has been referred to a new emerging class of uh, magnetic materials. So we will see that there are theoretical predictions of uh, different types of novel uh, spin currents in different forms that we can get in this material. For example, anomalous Hall effect uh, and longitudinal spin polarized current and also transverse spin current in absence of spin orbit coupling. So here, uh, all these effects are very important uh, and one way we can distinguish that this is really coming from this band structure is the crystal axis dependent. Mm -hmm. So that is, uh, that, uh, that is applicable for, for all of these uh, 
uh, all of these uh, effects. So uh, here uh, we are only probably looking at in this particular work, uh, these theoretical pr uh, predictions, and we try to uh, exper experimentally probe uh, uh, as much as we can. So here, the key concept is, so previously I stated that we need uh, spin orbit coupling to get the transverse spin current, but here the difference is that we don't need spin orbit coupling. The spin speed band is enough to produce this, uh, this transverse spin current. And second key thing is that here the generated spin current will be uh, nearly parallel to the nails vector. So these are the two key differences uh, of this uh, unconventional transverse spin current as compared to the regular relativistic transverse uh, spin hall current. Okay, so uh, as part of the theory, let's consider this is, this is a ruthenium dioxide uh, crystal. Uh, this is a 001 plane, and this shaded area is 101 plane. The Dales vector roughly points uh, approximately 001 direction, which is a C axis. So the theory suggests that if I run current along uh, one of these axis, X or Y, suppose 010 axis, then we will have the flow of transverse spin current with the, with the Niels vector uh, perpendicular to the Z axis. Okay, then you first tell me that this also happens in the regular spin hall effect. Current flows in X, Z polarized spins in Y. Then, then uh, how can we experimentally distinguish it? It is very hard. But the answer is not. Uh, so there is a key and uh, important difference because for the spin hall effect, we have flow of spin current uh, in all different planes, which is not possible here because it, because it is limited uh, by the crystal axis. For example, we cannot have spin current flowing out of the plane because we have Niels vector pointing at, along C axis and it has to be perpendicular to it. So this is fundamentally different from the regular spin hall effect. Now, the point is that how do we experimentally distinguish this? So for that, we find that if we work on a different plane, instead of having 001 plane, such as 101 plane, then we can really distinguish it. The reason is that, so one can uh, take a nice coordinate rotation from 001 planes, this shaded area, to 101 plane. So now this plane comes here. So because of this coordinate rotation, it is very obvious that the generated spin currents by this mechanism would be canted or tilted again, approximately parallel to the Niels vector. Now, if I compare this uh, situation uh, or this scenario uh, with respect to the regular spin hall effect, they are now distinctly different. So the point is, or take our message is that if we can uh, really experimentally observe such tilted spin current, that would be a possibility uh, of a uh, demonstration of the spin split bands through uh, these electronic uh, measurements. Okay. Then the question is, how do we measure such a tilted spin current? Okay, so now the point is, we have the spin current generation and we need a detector, which could be a magnet. So we need a magnet adjacent to the spin source, as shown here, uh, we, have, we have implemented Parmalloy, and this is a high quality TM image shown, uh, atomistically uh, sharp interface, and now, since this magnet uh, absorbs the injected spin current, there will be different types of torques. So here already you see that the, the generated spin current is complicated or tilted. So there will be a complex nature of the torques. And by analyzing the spin torque response, we can exactly identify and quantify all different types of uh, spin, spin currents getting generated by this material. To, uh, to uh, quantify that, we fabricated devices on 101 uh, plane such that we can run current along different crystallographic directions. So again, uh, again and again, I like to mention that this is one of the key aspects that we can uh, uh, unambiguously distinguish whether this mechanism is coming from this type of noble spin speed bands or not. So crystal axis dependence is very important. So here we see that first, uh, this nail vector has a projection out of the plane and also in the plane meaning if we run current along this axis, we can get Z polarized spins, point number one. And if we run current along an arbitrary crystallographic direction, such as in this, I call it psi, then the in-plane uh, Niels vector projections have now two different directions along the current and perpendicular to it. Meaning if we work through, through the maths, then we will see that this material will generate all X, Y, X, Y, and Z polarized spin current 
but that will have a perfect or a specific uh, crystal axis dependence. So now, if now our uh, goal is uh, to uh, do uh, spin torque measurements in this type of bilayers and try to see whether we get this type of angular dependence in our measurement or not. Okay, so to do this, uh, okay, before that, uh, one uh, important point. So uh, we, uh, we uh, also calculated uh, the, uh, the spin hull conductivity uh, of X, Y, and Z polarized spins in this material, uh, considering spin orbit coupling with and without the spin orbit coupling. Here it clearly shows that the, without the spin orbit coupling, the transverse spin current is an order of magnitude larger than with the spin orbit coupling. So it is an order of magnitude small. Okay, so that is point number one. And point number two is that in the time odd spin current, okay, so the second point is that so this, uh, this would be time odd spin current and this is be time even spin current. So in this time odd spin current, there is gamma factor here. Meaning, if we do the measurement as a function of temperature, probably we can see strong uh, torque dependence, strong dependence on the torque that also we can experimentally probe. For example, our theory collaborators uh, checked if we have uh, gamma, these two values for these two roughly uh, longitudinal electrical uh, kind of resistivity, then how, how much change we can expect. So it is quite substantial. That is something what we can also exp experimentally probe. Okay, so now I like to briefly discuss the measurement techniques that how we reach to certain conclusion. So here uh, again, I will study different crystallographic directions to probe the spin torque. Here I am showing only two directions. I call it psi equal to zero when I pass current in this direction, and psi equal to ninety when I pass current in this direction. So the, our technique, measurement technique one, is STFMR, spin torque ferromagnetic resonance. The basic idea is that we apply microwave current in this bilayer and measure DC voltage. So because there are different types of spin current generated by this material and it produces different types of torques, so all X and Y and Z component uh, torques will, uh, spins will produce different types of torque and as a result, magnet will oscillate. So we have oscillating resistance and uh, from AMR and oscillating current, current. The homodyne mixing of that will produce DC voltage that we can measure by sweeping magnetic field. So just to give you an idea how the data looks like, because of the resonance, we always get a symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian in our experiment. And from this symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian, we can know all about in-plane and out-of-plane torques. The second point is that we repeat this experiment uh, by sweeping at, uh, magnetic field at, at, uh, at different, different five values. And from that, we can get the angular dependence of this symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian. Now, from this angular dependence of symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian, we can know all six different types of torques, three different types of damping-like, and three different types of fill-like torques. So this is what we are interested in to see experimentally. So this is the data after doing all this set of measurements. The first thing we observe that, so this is the angular dependence of symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian. The first thing that you immediately notice is that the angular dependence is different in uh, the symmetric and anti-symmetric Lorentzian, and it is substantial. So this difference is because of this extra term. The symmetric Lorentzian can be explained by this regular uh, cos phi sine two phi term, meaning we have regular spin hall effect. But however, this difference, what you can clearly see, is because of this extra term, which indicates we have out of plane spins flowing in the out of plane direction. So we have unconventional spin current present when we run current in this crystal direction. But in contrast, so when we run current in this direction, we find that both the angular dependence are trivial. Meaning here we have regular spin hall effect and here we have regular Oersted field. So basically it suggests that we have a very strong crystal axis dependent unconventional spin current. So when we see this first, so we like to uh, cross-check this by doing other experimental measurement techniques. So uh, we performed second harmonic hall measurements to cross-check if something funny happening with the previous measurement. So uh, here the basic idea is similar. Instead of running uh, radio frequency current, here we run a low frequency current and measure second harmonic hall voltage by uh, rotating magnetic field in the plane. 
Again, there are different types of torques. So magnet will uh, oscillate uh, and homodynamic swing uh, will produce again harmonic hall voltage, which we can fit uh, with this, oops, okay, well, which we can fit with this expression. And sometimes uh, there can be also contribution from the thermal uh, effects, but that, that we can sort it out from the field dependence of these coefficients. So it is very easy to sort out thermal signals. So when we analyze the data, we find that, again, the angular dependence uh, for these two crystallographic directions, again, distinctly different. For this case, when we run, run current cycle to 90, we find that this angular dependence can be explained by the standard term, meaning we have regular swing hall effect and we have Oersted field, simple. But here, the clear difference that you see between these two signals is because of this extra term, again, suggesting that we have unconventional out of plane spins flowing in the out of plane direction. Meaning, uh, we, uh, we performed two uh, different type of measurements and both are in agreement and both suggest that we have very strong crystal axis dependent unconventional torques. Now, not only these two uh, crystal axis, we uh, perform our experiment for different values of size and uh, if we compile all the results, so this is the summary. So we find that Y, Z and X polarized spins having angular dependence cos cos psi, cos psi, and sine to psi, very much in agreement with the theoretical predictions. Meaning we have experimentally observed the unconventional tilted spin current, which is very strong, strongly crystal axis dependent, and that is the consequence of these recently predicted novel spin speed bands of this alter magnet. Okay, so now it is time to test certain things because observing uh, Results is not enough. It has to pass through various control experiments, particularly important in spintronics. So the first thing came in my mind, whether uh, it, is, it is due to the weird 101 surface, or 101 rutile surface or not. So we have very carefully checked iridium dioxide. So it has very similar crystal structure. And in our MB chambers, the growth conditions were very similar. We do not see any unconventional torques in iridium dioxide, meaning the rutile crystal structure is not enough. We need the Niels vector, so which is present here. So it is very clear. So second thing is that, okay, is this again problematic on the 101? The thing is that no, we, we uh, checked. We checked also other plane 001. 001 plane doesn't show any extraordinary torques. That is also expected. We don't expect extra, uh, extraordinary torques uh, from the 001 plane. So again, with agreement with the theoretical predictions, that very strong, not only crystal axis and crystal plane dependence, and that is how we can uniquely and unambiguously distinguish this effect from the regular spin hall effect or other effects. Okay, so we did some other experiments. For example, we have inserted, oops, we have inserted spacer between the generator and the magnet. It, I believe it was 1.2 nanometer. So the signal has gone down because iridium has a, a very small spin diffusion length, but, but it is sizable, it is non-zero, meaning it is generating from the bulk of ruthenium dioxide, nothing surprising happening from the interface. And also we varied the thickness of ruthenium dioxide, seems like yeah, it is also very much consistent with the theoretical predictions that the bulk spin current is the dominant role. The next and last point, very important, as I promised that we did uh, temperature dependent measurement, probably that can give us some clue that what is going on and what mechanism. So again, there is a strong temperature dependence. If I compare from the room temperature, 0.5 to 1.5, so something like 200% increase in the torques. So considering the conductivity or resistivity we have, we do not expect this large enhancement. So this somehow suggests that there could be also contribution from the time odd spin current, uh, probably together with time even spin current as well. So in general, the final remark is that we, we, uh, we perform spin orbit torque measurements in this very high quality ruthenium dioxide, uh, single crystal ruthenium dioxide, parmalloy bilayers, and we find strong anisotropy uh, in the spin orbit torques, and uh, through uh, which we refer as tilted spin current, and this is very much consistent with the recent predictions of the alter magnetic spin split band structure of ruthenium dioxide. So with this, I like to uh, 
conclude my talk by thanking uh, my collaborators. So the people uh, who have grown uh, samples, very high quality samples, they have been growing ruthenates and edits for uh, maybe 10 years. We have very, I was lucky we had very high quality samples. We got very good support, theoretical support from Ding Fu. Uh, uh, working with Professor Simbal, uh, he was the guy who came up that your data could be explained by this recent uh, proposed mechanism. So there are also other contributions uh, from the graduate students. And uh, uh, I'm also thankful to the uh, great uh, Cornell Nanofabrication Facility and also supervision from Dan, Dan, Dan and Bob. Thank you very much for your attention and look forward to uh, questions. Thank you.